so um, the blurb kind of makes it look a bit like um, giving an overview or something like that. But um, I'm only talking about two things, um, really, because there's not much time. So I'm talking about T-SNE, which is a way of visualising the relationships between data and recurrent neural networks. Um, T-SNE stands for T-Distributed Stochastic Neighbour Embedding, which is a way of saying you're looking at a high dimensional space and you're making a casting a blanket through this space which is your two dimensional picture and you're casting points in that high dimensional space onto that picture um, and that gives you a map of where things how things relate um, and here's an example so if if you look at an image and reduce it to 20 by 20 pixels, or any number of pixels, or even if you take the whole thing, then if each pixel you treat as a value, this um, you'd, you'd get a vector of, if you, get, if you just to reduce it to 20 pixels square, you get 400 numbers, and that gives you a 400 dimensional space, and then all of the images would be cast somewhere in this space and then images that are similar in their, in their composition will end up close together and images that are um, different will be far apart um, and the t SNE casts that into a two dimensional picture and um, so here's an um, a example of a t SNE map now so what do we have? Well, like up here, there's these pictures are close together. You have to look up in the corner. Um, the, you can see they're actually from the same studio, the same lights in the background. Here, here's there's a whole lot of pictures that um, are arranged together because they're of museum-y things photographed against a dark background. Here. Um, there's another pile of round things down here. Now, this is this is just doing the simplest thing I could possibly do um, two nights ago. <laughs> here, here, here's a here's a, um, a a row of fashion items. So um, these pictures. The, there's a whole lot of fashion photos and they're, they're all clustering together not because um, they're the same well they are the same kind of thing but it's because the conventions of, of this photography um, you know, they were taken the same way at that time and get a bit further along it gets into these funny things um, and yeah so the um, down here there's a, a, a style of portrait that, that all you know all these people photographed in the same style um, somewhere I found a near there there's a whole lot of horses oh, here they go um, so the way is it's not that these horses are the same it's the way in which people photograph horses is the same the, the composition is the same and here's, here's some people who look like a horse. <laughs> <laughs> and like, there's some trees that look like a horse. Um, so, I mean, you, you could use something like that for, for exploring a, a, um, an image collection, but I'm not talking about that today. I'm talking about... Oh, I need to go there. Um, I, so that, that, that was just using, like I was saying, it's, it's, it's reducing them to grayscale and using the, the pixels as the features, and, that, and so that concentrates on the composition and um, not on, you know, things like facial recognition, which, what's the thing? Um, and so if you use more sophisticated things like count of the faces or something, you'd get a different clustering of the images and, and um, it might be whispering 
but I, I quite like the um, just using the raw values because you, you get that, that um, comp compositional insight. So how you use this for text is um, you'd extract features from your documents and then you'd, you'd cast them into the onto the PCN map, and then you'd see how what how the text ends up. Um, now the example which is I'm using, I use some character engrams, which I'll just describe briefly. It, it means you count how how often each sequence of characters comes up. So the, the the sequence of cats out on the map. The three characters PHE occur twice. The the AT sp space occurs three times. It's a, it's a very atty little sentence. Um, and just those, those counts become um, a vector, which is a, is a location in that high dimensional space, which then you can reduce to um, two dimensions using PSNE. Now, this is a project I did with National Library. Um, looking, there was lots of money watching around for World War One stuff, of course, this year. Um, you'll get sick of it by the end of tomorrow. Um, so, looking at newspaper articles and looking at the, th the character engrams in newspaper articles and um, mapping them out. Now, the coloured according to the year that they come so the, I don't know if you can see it at the back the um, the darker ones are uh, 1913 and the green kind of goes through the year wars and it ends up at red um, now each of these boxes um, these are bits where I, I zoomed in, I don't have a nice zooming interface so I can't show you in real time I was going to try and do that but I to be instead. Um, so each of the, each, the this, this is I was just looking around and uh, like the ones the shipping charts up the top and the moon and tide charts they're kind of similar the lists of numbers. There's lists of lists of people is an, another strong cluster whether they're casualties or the graduates from universities and stuff. And then there's there's somewhere. Um, there's a whole lot of ones about French warfare, um, which are just little short two sentences, but they're using the same because they're using the same um, phrases over and over again. They end up with the same character engram count, so they all cluster together. So now, if you could zoom in there, if I had that thing working and click on those and see what they were about, you'd see that they were all little short stories about French warfare. And then there's another bit about um, warfare involving French. About using group movements like, you know, the 30 miles from Belfast or something like that, and um, there's also now that's just looking at articles. Now if I put in the um, in the papers past corpus, there's articles and there's advertisements, and that's like the two types of things we've got. Um, now here the red dots are articles and the black dots are advertisements and they separate quite nicely. But around the place there's a few there's a few um, black dots in the red and there's a few red dots in the black. And that could either be that that's an ad that looks like an article to this analysis, or it could be a misclassification for some reason. And so I looked at this five of them down there in, this, in that yellow rectangle and in fact they you can't read it um, they are actually articles that are misclassified as ads so this is another way which you can use TSNE is you can you can verify some of your um, metadata yeah, it, it shows up um, things just outliers and kind of shows the way in which the outliers um, and can you read this one? I don't know. So here's here's another zoom from somewhere in here, but I don't know where because I lost it. Um, 
this is just showing that this is a collection of um, the articles, but they're all um, health related and they happen to be recommending uh, one product or another, um, like genuine Sanders extract, the, the, the yeah, quack advertorials. Um, so th th that's the first thing I was, how long did that take? Okay, um, that's a f now I'm gonna talk about recurrent neural networks, which is um, what I do a lot of. Uh, la language modeling. Um, oh, I've got a I've got a demo here too. Um, so I don't know if you can read this because it, it's quite small. Um, this is a recurrent neural network reading Dickens and and trying to learn how is predicting the next character of um, the stream as it goes along. And every now and then it generates, it generates um, a, a line based on its predictions on, on its model. So it's, it's trying to learn to predict what Dickens is writing. And so at the top it was nonsense. And as it learns, it's getting, it's getting uh, more and more Dickensian. Um, <laughs> and that that number over there, the cyan number, is a is that's a cross entropy against a validation set, which is an indication of um, how well it's it's matching Dickens. So it, it's getting lower and lower, and um, it'll get down to. So it's only a small model this one, but it would get down to about two or something, which isn't isn't all that good. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave it going for a while. Um, but, but as far as language modeling goes, that's actually quite good. It's better than, it's better than the, the state of the art a wee while ago. Um, and oh, you don't need to see the, now, um, a recurrent neural network is a neural network where the previous generations um, Hidden state is passed on to the the new state there. And now, if you don't um, if you don't understand the squiggly line, that's that's okay. I'm not going to talk about that. But it's kind of like the the input is just saying what what letter turned up, and the um, and the, the there's these weights that kind of go into the round, the grey round circles that are the hidden state and then the, the pink ones are the output. And it just kind of remembers as far back as it needs to, basically, to make a prediction for the next character. So it's, um, it's by far the best way of modelling language at the moment. I, this is a better picture. Um, so a, a, a character level language model predicts the next character um, based on what it's seen. And you can also do a word level language model, which is um, better, but it's less robust against noise and strange characters. Now, I tried using these recurrent neural networks on the paper's past um, corpus, but it didn't work because um, the OCR was bad. Um, and there was just too much noise. Um, and one new, this is going off on a tangent again, um, slightly different. Now, I have used recurrent, who saw my talk last year? So I'm trying not to talk about the same stuff, right? Not many of you. Okay, last year I talked about um, detecting authorship on whale oil and um, using recurrent neural networks. And then, then I developed this, um, technique where the recurrent neural network language model has it models all the author's language at once and has different um, outputs for each author and, and by the, the relative accuracy of their predictions predicts who the author is and then I entered this in a competition for the, like a, the international author identification competition 
and they won by um, quite a margin. So this is actually the, the, the best way of identifying authors um, in the world at the moment. Um, so that, that, is a th that is something you could use on your text ar archive if you, ha if you have um, stuff, you don't know who wrote it, and you have examples of people who you think might have written it, uh, this kind of machine could tell you. Um, another thing you can do with a language model is make the OCR better. Um, now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not actually trying to pick on the people who did digitise the, um, the papers past because they were using, you know, what was good at the time and they were using old um, microfilm and stuff like that. But a, a good language model shouldn't make these kind of mistakes. Like, it shouldn't think that let a feel is a good way to start a, a sentence. It shouldn't, it shouldn't, I mean, uh, you, if you see this, you should never think that that is a, is a, a, a good word to, to put out. Um, um, you, if you're looking at a, an article from 1913, you wouldn't put the copyright symbol in. It wasn't, it, you know, it wasn't current. You wouldn't use the word euros. Um, in fact, the paper's passed and it has the euro symbol in it in, in, some, of these, uh, in some of the OCR, um, which, you know, was invented in 1996. But the, so the OCR machine doesn't know, it should know, that it would never find a euro symbol. I mean, the, this, it wouldn't even find any symbols. This is hot metal printing. It's, you know, they've got a tiny character set. They're not going to have anything, but... Um, language models before recently, they were always kind of baked in and, 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 and nobody um, altered them. But in, like here, like this is modelling Dickens um, better than, you know, after five minutes, it's modelling Dickens better than... Um, most OCR models would. So if you were trying to do OCR of Dickens, which you wouldn't need to because it's already done, but um, if you use th this language model, you'd, you'd do better than a commercial OCR system, supposing you had the, the, the other parts of it done. So um, a recurrent neural network language model would be very useful in doing OCR of New Zealand text because you could you can use you can use the language of the period. You can use the place names. You can use um, Maori words or whatever. And quite quickly, you make up a language model that's much better than anything that's been used before. Just stop there for a minute. With the use of Maori language, so it's only looking at the composition of it, so it picks up the language straight away in the sense that a lot of them don't pick up the Maori language. I would I would pick up the. Um, yeah, the patterns, yeah. and and but it, 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 it ends up picking up. I don't know if this is doing it. Yeah, um, this isn't really quite doing it, but it ends up picking up. Um, you know, it's expecting a noun, and then it's expecting a verb, whatever. It, it picks up syntax. Um, okay, and that, that's what I had to say. Um, not much. Oh, um, and and. Catalyst, I work for them part time now, um, and they paid for me to come here. So. <laughs> Got questions? Oh, yeah. Thanks. I, I really enjoyed that, Douglas. Thank you. It always blows my mind when you talk. Um, if you are applying a recurrent neural network, um, language model to a body of texts, yeah. In a particular so context, so I don't know, like early nineteenth century text or, or whatever. How large does the corpus, the reference corpus, need to be in order for, to get meaningful results? Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
It, it depends what you mean by meaningful. Um, <laughs> well, like this one here, it, it's, it's done two and a half million, two and a half thousand K of, of, of Dickens. So that's, uh, and that's the chapters all muddled up, so it's not just one book, it's doing a whole lot. Um, and if it trained, if it only had that much and trained over and over on that, uh, and it was a bigger net, it would, it would get, it would get down to cross entropy like you could get 1.8 or something like that, with this kind of model, which um, is good for a character level model. Um, if you had a word level model, you need more text and you get better results. If you got huge amounts of text, but a character level one. Um, tends to do better with a small. Um, so, so uh, like a million words will be enough for anything, for for, for character level. Is, is cross entropy the only metric that you need to keep your eye on, or are there others? That... Uh, it's the best one. Well, uh, uh, that's that's the measure of. Um, there are other ones that kind of equate to the same thing, like perplexity and probability and stuff, but um, it's the one that suits me anyway. I wonder if we could, whoa, it works, if we could pick up the comment that you made about the Maori language and using the recurrent neural networks with the question about um, amount of right. character compared to word in a Maori setting. Can you sort of Give us some advice on that. Um, if you don't have much text, the characters are better, and and a few hundred thousand characters as as good, you know. Um, with words, you need more, but you if you have heaps and heaps and heaps, the words will be better. Um, I think maybe with Māori, it, characters might actually do better than with English because it's more regular and there aren't so many characters and it's kind of, you know, English is, is a terrible spelling and, and Māori hasn't, so yeah. Is there any benefit in doing um, character level, um, you know, a recursive technique first, and then following it with uh, a word, a recursive word um, process? Um, maybe that um, another way to do it would be to have a, a word level thing and then fall back to character level when it finds word. It doesn't know. Um, we'll kind of combine them like that. Uh, um, but you could, if you like, if you if you, it'd be easy to do a character one um, straight off. And if it doesn't work, then you try something else. Because I guess I'm just thinking, you know, the papers past example, you'll have, you know, the OCR correction on at the character level, and so some of the characters in a word may be correct, but then yeah. others are just. You know, completely wrong. Um, yeah. So I'm just, yeah, I'm just interested which which way is better. Uh, yeah. So you think I, you're I, well, I don't really know because I, I, I'm I don't, I'm not an OCR person, but um, I'd love to have a go. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Could you train it to recognize um, like common misprints, like? Like a C um, and L is sometimes supposed to be a D when it's not quite printed right. Like, could it learn something like that? Right. So, yeah, you mean you mean that 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 uh, that character that character combination sometimes yeah. comes up accidentally as C L when it should be a D in a word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the kind of thing it would recognize if 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 a D was more likely there. It would be should be saying this is more like to be a D than a C L, you know. It's, it's, it's kind of in dialogue with the 
the optical part of it, which is suggesting something, and and it, um, it says you're talking rubbish when you're suggesting a CL. You should, yeah. Um, is, could you actually just OCR with that, like off the images? I mean, you showed your uh, contrasty thing to start with with the images. Like, uh, I mean, we use um, as the person responsible for giving you that text. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, I mean, a lot of that is you know we're using Abby Fine Reader, which is what our vendor uses, and it's from Russia or whatever. It probably doesn't really know Maori that well unless you give it the specific things or whatever. But I mean, could your what have you, neural magic, um, actually do OCR, like off an image, and make text? Is that like something it could do? Um, not, no, I don't really stands. understand what you're doing, to be honest. Uh, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, people, people do use recurrent neural networks for handwriting recognition, for example, where they, where they excel. And I don't know if they're using them for OCR directly to, from the image, but... Um, they should be trying it. Right. So that brings us to the end of the session time. So um, again, yep. time to move around if you want to. Thank you very much, Douglas, for that. I think we've got some very fascinated people in the audience.